We are very honored that you came and even more honored to present this lecture. Uh, Rod and Madge Webster were the very heart and soul of the Adler's collection for many years in the, in the past. And as I'm sure some of you are aware, the story of their connection to the Adler started back in 1962. Uh, this is when the year when they found an odd artifact in an antique sto uh, store, uh, a sundial. We affectionately refer to it as the sundial that started it all. They were intrigued and sort of curious, and they thought, well, what is this? You know, how do, what's the history of a sundial? How did it uh, come to be in this, in this uh, store? Uh, where, how does it fit in the sort of whole history, the tapestry of uh, the history of science? And so they went to the place where they figured they could get some answers, which was the British Museum. And the British Museum, the curators there said, you know, you're on the wrong side of the Atlantic. There's this great place that has a fantastic collection of uh, sundials, the Adler Planetarium, right in their ho my hometown. But nobody answered correspondence there. So they didn't have any curators. And so uh, that's sort of where it started. And then for the next uh, three, four uh, decades, they became first volunteer caretakers and then volunteer curators of the Adler's collection. And so there's just this, uh, it's a huge list. Uh, they had no formal training uh, in this, but they had so much dedication and developed so much knowledge and experience through talking with people and working with the collection, that they became very respected members of the scientific instruments community. Uh, and they became extremely engaged in the Adler. Uh, Rod, we Rod Webster became a chair of the board. They were on the collections committee, uh, life trustees. Uh, Rod uh, Webster signed the Articles of Incorporation of the Adler when it became distinct from the Park District, uh, on and on. Uh, they more than doubled the size of the Adler's collection through, uh, through acquisitions, sometimes funded by, uh, by their own money out of their pockets. They purchased one of the first computers the Adler ever had so that they could uh, make access to the collections better. That's something that we're very proud that we're continuing that legacy through our net current collections access, access initiative. So there are many ways in which the, uh, the Webster's legacy lives on. It's no exaggeration whatsoever to say that uh, our current collections and the current uh, dedication of the Adler to the collections is a product of the Webster's. And so uh, there's little more to say uh, than that you know, we, we, we hold the Webster's in very high esteem. And so it's, it's, it's a great privilege to be able to uh, partner with the American uh, Institute for uh, the Archaeological Institute of America in uh, holding these lectures, these annual lectures. So, uh, in memory of the in, of the Websters, I look forward to this wonderful uh, lecture and thank you so much for coming here. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Petra. Okay, Hudekhubure. <laughs> All right, never mind. Dr. G, as, as her students will call her, uh, to introduce, who's the president of the local uh, Chicago chapter of the AIA, uh, who will introduce the speaker and tell us a little bit more about uh, this great uh, series. Thank you. Well, um, thank you so much. So, um, so the Webster's love for ancient astronomy uh, brought him, you know, perhaps naturally to the Archaeological Institute of America. And they, in collaboration with the AI, have set up a lectures, uh, lecture series. This is better, I was out of reach. Um, a lecture series, an annual series. Every uh, year, they choose one speaker who will present three uh, Webster lectures throughout the United States. And of course, we're very fortunate that the Webster are actually at home here and that we can do this jointly with the Adler. Um, so uh, before I will introduce our speaker of tonight, I will have to say a few things about the uh, Archaeological Institute of America. Um, uh, maybe if you're not already members, you would like to become a member. So we offer a membership. And what this uh, organization does, it, it forms a, a kind of a, a community between professional archaeologists and people who are interested in archaeology. So. Um, if you are anyway interested in uh, archaeology, this is the place really to be. So um, you can join a local society, and there are many benefits to that. Uh, it is the largest archaeological organization basically in the world. 
um, we offer opportunities for students, like as it says, the Waldbaum scholarships to participate in archaeological fieldwork. There are benefits this, for students among you. There are discounted benefits. You have discounts. We have publications. Uh, we have uh, an official, the American Journal of Archaeology, that is the this is at the premier professional publication for uh, academic articles. But we also have an. Uh, I have brought a few our archaeology magazine that covers everything that uh, our archaeologists do. So on the slide, I think I duplicated that by well, Egypt, for example, or you can read about, the, you cannot see this, but okay, this is Maya culture. Uh, I didn't anticipate a large hall like this. So, or Chinese, if you can see <laughs> in the light, Chinese Buddhism. Or Roman aqueduct. So it goes all over the world and through all times. Uh, the AIA is involved in site preservation, for example, safeguards archaeological heritage around the world. And then, of course, very important, outreach. Um, every year we organize International Archaeology Day throughout uh, the United States and actually the world, where every a uh, local society tries to do something interesting to celebrate this day. You can travel, go to archaeological sites on AIA tours, and you can all find this on the website of the AIA. And then finally, help the, I like this, help the AIA soar. So you can earn flyer miles. If this talk didn't convince you to become a member, maybe this can lure you. Um, and. Saving on insurance is also very important. But, you know, leaving that aside, I would like now, uh, I would like to skip, or go, not skip, go to uh, Dr. Susan Milbrath. Um, Dr. Milbrath is curator of Latin American art and archaeology and an affiliate professor of anthropology at the University of Florida. And she has her, her uh, degree is from Columbia University. Her research interests include the Mesoamerican worldview and connections between seasonal festivals and astronomy. And um, in this case, the Codex Bordia. And her most recent publication is Heaven and Earth. And I want to really, that, you know, you, there are flyers out there. You can actually buy her book and look at the book. Don't take the book away, it's from here. But look at her book, take the flyer, and, you know, buy it Heaven and Earth in Ancient Mexico Astronomy and Seasonal Cycles in the Codex Borgia. So uh, now I would like then to, where is our speaker actually? <laughs> <laughs> Over there. Uh, decoding the astronomical narrative in the Codex Borgia, Susan Milbreath. Thank you, Petra. Can everybody hear me okay? Or, no, that's kind of, can you hear me okay? Okay. All right. Um, when I was first thinking of a title for my book, I wanted to use the word decoding. And my fellow uh, archaeoastronomer and uh, longtime colleague, uh, Tony Avini, said, no, no, don't use the word code. Think of the Da Vinci Code and, and you know, Brown's book. And, and people will you know, think of that as what you're trying to do. But in fact, that is kind of what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to. Uh, solve a puzzle that's a, been a puzzle for probably the last 150 years. And um, I started off uh, searching for the, the, the code or the key to this puzzle uh, about 30 years ago. And I've made gradual progress. And I now feel ready to say that I think I've cracked the code. So, But now, what is this code about? It's in the Codex Borgia, which Codex is a painted book, a pre-Columbian book that folds like an accordion. And this particular Codex is uh, in the Vatican Library because it came over from uh, Mexico a long time ago, probably with the second uh, uh, flotilla that uh, Cortez sent back from central Mexico uh, along uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And if you see, uh, if you look at the map here, you'll see that this is an inset from the area that this codex is probably from. Central Mexico, the Aztec capital, Tenochtitlan, 
is in a neighboring valley, the Valley of Mexico, and then the Puebla Tlaxcala Valley is uh, where we believe the Codex Borgia is from. And then I want you to look in the lower left that this is the current condition of the manuscript, which I've seen and held in my hand in, in, in the Vatican Library, and it's in great condition. There are only uh, certain parts of it that are, are eroded. From now on, we will be seeing the reconstructed version that is available at a very uh, modest price uh, from Dover, uh, a, essentially a complete reconstruction of the codex. And I use those and, and my own reconstructions in my book. So these are the reconstructed images you see. And I wanted to use this slide to tell you that essentially in decoding this manuscript, uh, particularly the narrative section that is unique in Mesoamerica, it's, there's no other one like it, um, that I, I used uh, essentially four principles. And one of them was to look at the changing aspects of Venus um, in the codex to try and figure out uh, what stage in the cycle Venus was represented. I recognized eclipse imagery, which you can see in the upper right uh, most recently, and that really helped me to nail down a year in which this, um, this manuscript might be referring to. And then I more broadly recognized uh, festivals that belong to the Aztec festival calendar that is also shared, shared by Tlaxcala, uh, the neighboring valley. And then I found, uh, with all of this kind of uh, armature of chronology, that I was able to recognize seasonal imagery, such as a maize harvest uh, image that has never been described that way before. But in fact, uh, maize is shown repeatedly around the corner, and the maize is actually being consumed by the gods. Well, of course, we're going to look at all of this in greater detail, but I wanted to let you know where we're going. Oops, I think I went too far. All right, well, the first thing that I found was that I could recognize some what are called Ventana festivals, which are 20-day uh, periods, Ventanas meaning 20s, uh, in the, in the uh, narrative, which is exactly 18 pages long. And there are exactly 18 festivals in the Aztec and Tlaxcalan fe festival calendar. So this led me to think that I had some kind of chronological framework here. And I actually um, was able to, to see some relationship to the Aztec festivals, uh, particularly ones, uh, the first one I recognized was uh, the uh, Tlacashipi Walitzli festival. Uh, and, but I wanted to let you know what why are they, these records, why do they exist? Well, when the Spaniards came and found a very active religious community uh, when they conquered the, the Aztecs in Mexico uh, in 1521, they were very interested in recording all of the festivals that they celebrated so that they could be sure that the, that the people didn't continue to celebrate them uh, hidden in the guise of, of uh, Christian religion. And even, even at that point in time, however, they were able to, to recognize some important uh, seasonality to these rituals. And for instance, uh, in Cortez's map, he actually uh, showed the twin temples of the Templo Mayor with a little tiny sun face, a European sun face peeking out between the temples. And uh, we, we know from other descriptions, from colonial period descriptions, that the Aztec emperor actually tore down the uh, temple to make it align with the equinox, which is, of course, in spring uh, and in fall around the 21st of uh, March and the 21st of September. And he tore it down and had it realigned. And actually, the archaeologists have excavated that site and have found that it is indeed aligned to the equinox. So we know that they were practicing seasonal festivals. And I, I felt sure that we could recognize some of these uh, in the Codex Borgia. And this is the first one that I recognized, which is where Shipetotec, uh, the god of spring, essentially, uh, is sacrificed as, as in to, to uh, keep the seasonal cycle going. Um, and he's shown here uh, more in detail, this uh, detailed view, on a round stone of sacrifice. And he's played out, um, which we will see again later on. This, we'll see the same image again. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that you actually have also imagery of the solar disk, just as in Cortez's map, peeping, peeking over uh, this temple. 
So with the Vaitana festivals, please don't try to read all of this. I mean, I was like, this was initially prepared for a class, and then I said, oh no, I put this too much words on this. Just, just listen to me. Uh, if you get lost, you can look there. But um, the Vaintena festivals are, are essentially calendar uh, festivals, and it, it's noteworthy that since they're 20-day periods, we should have some evidence of 20-day periods in the manuscript, and we do. In fact, every page refers to a, almost every page refers to a set of 20 days, and on the second page of this sequence, the entire 20-day uh, period, which has each with a different day sign, is arrayed in completion. This had been called by a previous uh, uh, study uh, by Elizabeth Boone as the birth of the calendar. And um, I think that, uh, that she tried to do a cosmological interpretation for every single page in this uh, manuscript. But I find that you actually uh, can work better if you think of, of these events that are mythological in a mytho-historical way, um, such as in seasonal cycles of religious nature, which we do ourselves in the Christian uh, tradition with the annual celebration of the birth of Christ and the annual resurrection of Christ after his death. These are the kinds of things that were going on in central Mexican religion as well in the Ventana festivals. The 18 pages of the Codex Borgia uh, link uh, with the Tlaxcalan calendar, and each page, in my opinion, represents a 20-day period. So pages 29 through 46 it essentially comprises what would be a 360-day period, but as you'll see, there's an extra five days thrown in um, because there's an extra period in between one of the, uh, uh, actually shown on one of the pages. Uh, most scenes are read as uh, pairs of pages, um, such as you see a paired image here with the temple that we just looked at, and the next page shows the, a similar kind of temple. So there's a kind of an attempt to pair pages into larger 40-day periods. And then, furthermore, uh, there are some that are narratively shown um, attached uh, with, with the chronological element uh, being uh, going from one page to the next. This is very much like what you see in the Primeros Memorialis, which is one of the early colonial period uh, records by Sahagun. They actually, the festival calendar is uh, arrayed from top to bottom, and the action moves from top to bottom. I found a very interesting overlap with uh, a Tlaxcalan festival calendar, where there's an actually an 18-page sequence an 18-month uh, sequence or Ventana sequence shown arrayed in a circle. It's colonial period, but it, uh, interestingly enough, uh, turns out to have the beginning point in a month that's called, or a festival that's called Ate Motsli, um, and it ends in Panquetzalitzli. And this is uh, essentially what I have going in the Codex Borgia. The first page, page 29, um, is, corresponds to Ate Motsli in terms of the chronology. And the last page corresponds to Panquetzalitzli. And the imagery on each page can't necessarily be linked with an actual festival because the main purpose of this narrative is astronomy. But they do fit in a number of astronomical uh, events that give you the chronology, and they also show you some of the festivals. And this particular festival is emphasized on the last page of the narrative, which is Panquetzalitzli, the, the last of the festivals shown on the, um, uh, in the uh, uh, Vetia festival calendar that was on the wheel that I just showed you. It actually, this one shows the annual fire ceremony uh, and marking the beginning of the dry season in November. So with that as uh, some kind of background, um, we'll move to uh, some of the specific astronomical events that are shown. Only six of the 18 pages actually show clear evidence of the Vaintena festivals. So they're just attempting to keep the chronology straight, I, in my opinion, and doing some of the mytho-historical uh, ceremonies that are involved with the annual cycle.